Yeah, it was not my idea. It came actually from a report telling how much plastic bottles we consume every minute. And just that short sentence was very powerful. It was a million bottles per minute. So you can make a good story around it. So I started thinking like, what's the best way for you to visualize this? If you hit the reader with a picture of a million bottles, it's really hard to get this real sense of scale. Maybe you're familiar with one bottle because probably you have bought this kind of plastic before. You know how big it is, you know how heavy it is. For sure, you're not familiar with a pile of a million bottles. You probably have never seen it unless you're working on recycling. But the point to me was I needed to find a way to introduce the reader from one very well-known object to this crazy amount of waste that we all produce all the time. The amount was astronomical, but also the pace of this is also incredible. So I guess the more natural way of seeing things, time visually is animation. So hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Secrets of the Viz. This week, we are having a special showcase on Marco. So if you haven't heard of Marco, he did an amazing job at Outlier this year, talking about his journey. He's a journalist at the New York Times, and his works are spectacular. So if you haven't seen it, make sure to check it out in the links that I've put in the description. So over to you, Marco, to do a short intro about yourself. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure always to share my new story with you all. I'm a know from Costa Rica. I actually started studying graphic design because nothing else was working. I was meant to do communication, but the best universities are public and it's very competitive and I was not good enough to get into the program. So at the end, I decided for design and one thing led me to another. I ended up working with graphics, which is perfect for journalism, arts, and basically the combination that I was looking for. So I guess my entire life has been covered around failure and trying different things. But luckily, when you stumble so many times, you find a new path. And I think that's why I decided to start collecting stories for the people about my own failures. I think when you get success, you rarely are learning something new, something you can use later often comes from failure. So that's how InfoFails was born. That's really true. I think we come to a point where as you are learning data visualizations, the core skills can be learned in as little as a month if you really put down the hours. But after that, it's all about exploration of ideas, learning from others. And just going through your info fail series, I've learned a lot. One of my favorites is definitely, I told you earlier, is the plastic bottles one because visually it's so appealing. You have the whole plastic bottles just flooding the entire city and everything. How did that whole idea start? Because I know that you iterate through the different concepts, but that idea had to come from somewhere, right? Yeah, it was not my idea. It was not my boss's idea anyway. It came actually from a report from a governmental agency in Europe. They did this study to estimate the consumption of plastic bottles, telling how much we consume every minute. And just that short sentence was very powerful. It was a million bottles per minute. So you can make a good story around it. The main shocking point there maybe was not the words itself, but true. Like many people say, an image could be more powerful than just a few words. So I started thinking like, what's the best way for you to visualize this? If you hit the reader with a picture of a million bottles, it's really hard to get this real sense of scale. Maybe you're familiar with one bottle because probably you have bought this kind of plastic before, you know how big it is, you know how heavy it is. For sure, you're not familiar with a pile of a million bottles. You probably have never seen it unless you're working on recycling. But the point to me was I needed to find a way to introduce the reader from one very well-known object to this crazy amount of waste that we all produce all the time. The amount was astronomical, 
but also the pace of this is also incredible. So I guess the more natural way of seeing things, time visually is animation. That's why I started exploring with 3D modeling and creating a lot of iterations. Just the first sequence, there were about 20, 21 versions and all of them with slightly different concepts, testing the physics, how the plastic bounces all around, the textures, the reflections. That's very cool. One of my favorite data visualization is when they have a common item that you understand and they try to use that to contextualize the scale of it. So it could be, you know, the size of Godzilla to how many football fields in terms of height that is. Uh, they compare it to the depth of the ocean, Mount Everest, and so on and so forth. All of this helps to build that understanding for how really big that is. And I think you've done splendidly in this visualization. What was the most challenging part in this entire project and how long it took? The whole project took a couple of months. The most exhausting part was the rendering. The idea was very clear. If you go into this article, you will see a, basically a trouble in time. You will start with minutes, then hours, days, months, years, and all the story that we know about plastics because I wanted the reader to be familiar with this element. The first frame that you will see there is just one bottle, one bottle that eventually will become a mountain of plastic tall enough to cover New York City. The concept took a couple of days to go from the first sketches to, okay, this is the thing that I wanted to do. Then it was mostly about technical stuff. Plastic often, especially for water, is blue. It gives you the idea of the freshness of the water. And if you are trying to sell a product, you probably want to focus on that. You don't want your bottle to be covered by many things around, but also if you're working for news, you need to be very careful not to make this bottle with the label of one particular brand. Otherwise you may get in trouble. Everything else has to be very subtle. And that's why the rest of the rendering is basically grayscale uh, to keep the attention of the reader on, on plastics all the time. I think that's a key point. And it, it ties in with the whole storytelling aspect of data visualization because you want people to focus on a certain thing. The points that you raise about it having a blue content, not having a label, drives focus back to the story itself. I think that's perfect. Was there any ideas that you initially explored and dropped off because it just couldn't fit in with the narrative or structure of it? Uh, uh, yeah. Probably I'm, a lot, right? I'm blanking it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. To, to be fair, we are talking about a project that it was a few years ago, but I don't really recall right now. You tricked me with this. You, you told me in the, my email, you don't need to be very prepared. And I was confident on that. <laughs> lie to me. You lied to me. <laughs> well, that's what I do. <laughs> no, just kidding. But yeah, but I, I think that's, that's perfect because often in times when we end a project, we don't really think about it unless something new pops in our mind or maybe a new article that you read somewhere that causes you to revisit the vis. But it's, I have a lot of unfinished visualizations in something called a graveyard in Figma, which mm. is like just snippets of screenshots or mood boards that I started. So every now and then I'll go back and see if there's anything I worth exploring or reviving from the dead, <laughs> which is why I call it the graveyard. I think there, there are two very key points to mention. One is documenting everything, like keep your archive, graveyard or whatever you want to call it there is very good for you to go back and check. More than 20 years ago, I was working in a local newspaper in Costa Rica. And I remember I was doing database for the print and for the web, but there were certain graphics that I wanted to recover and I managed to find some of them. But when I revisit those graphics, I was so embarrassed to see the mess that I was trying to portray to the poor readers, <laughs> like super complex layers on visual encoding that you needed 
I don't know, probably the whole day just to decode this one visualization that I was trying to achieve. And I could easily see how much my own judgment on visualization has changed. I remember someone complaining about how complex the visualization or something that was not accurate. So I, I took all those points into account and I grew with the rest of my practice. But it's easy to forget. So if you can keep them pin it there somewhere in the wall, it will make you a better professional for sure. I think all of us in general, we often focus on where we are going. But if you take a step back and just look behind you, you also would see how far you've come, the improvements mm -hmm. you've made, how you started to now where you are. There's definitely going to be a huge leap in skill, knowledge, and experience. So for those who feel unmotivated at any point of their career, just take a step back and look behind. You'll be amazed with actually what you have achieved. Yeah, and also remember the lessons you have learned on the way. Even the biggest failures that you have made have teach you something. You are a better person now because you have made mistakes. I'm pretty much into embracing failure, commit mistakes, and do things wrongly. That will give you confidence next time because you know this is not the way of doing things. So let me flip this question back to you. What was the biggest lesson you learned in your whole career? Working on graphics as a journalist implies that you are somehow explaining things that you don't know. Often, you need to try to become the most nerdy person around on that particular topic so I can tell the story to the readers. When I think I know things, I'm wrong. And that was very difficult to learn. And time is a challenge when you are working on news. You either get this on time or you don't publish. So the rush of the moment and being afraid to miss the window is a lot of pressure to handle. Uh, through time, I have learned that even if I am so in love with this topic, maybe it's better just let go. Uh, if it's something that is not possible to get it properly done within this time, maybe to just turn it into an info fails chapter and that will be better. Maybe it will help someone else that is looking for the same information. So those tiny things, they come after making mistakes, rushing things and publishing things that are not right. I remember a graphic that I did. No one knew about it. A typo in a number, very big number, actually. After a week or so, when I was coming back with one of the copies to my place, my son took the paper to see the graphic because he has a plenty of illustrations. And he told me, wait, is this not complete yet? And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And I look at it and I was like, wow, yeah, I made a huge mistake. But it's important that if you commit a mistake, you can always be transparent, acknowledge your mistake. But that is a very valuable lesson and something that you probably will forget in, in years to come. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I will never forget that. And I'm really sorry for all the readers. But yeah, I mean, we're humans and we all commit mistakes. What is not fair is to hide the mistake because then you are tweaking the reality. That is a very human thing to do. And I think that is also something very important in this era of AI, where you have a lot of things that are coming out that may or may not be written by humans. So we need to still embrace and keep that humanity in us just so we can thrive in this new era as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there any other upcoming projects that you're working on that you can share? I got a lot of overlapping assignments. There's also this other part of my own initiatives, which is one in particular that I was working when I was in the outlier. It's been a while since I have done a print but this one is a very bad business decision because <laughs> I'm not getting any money out of it. It's a graphic for a magazine. And the idea is to tell the story of how we are losing all the fireflies. So these creatures to me were very special because my town in Costa Rica is super small. It's very dark overnight because there's only like a thousand people living there. So at night you can see the edge of the Milky Way and all the stars around, but also tiny little flickers floating around you. When you look down, 
you will feel like all the stars suddenly drop on top of you and you're floating around all these lights overnight. And this is a three page graphic with many maps, which is the thing that I love to do, telling you that particular story, how we are losing the fireflies. If you're traveling to Europe, take a look into the shelves in the airports, which should be there by the end of the year. You just painted a really beautiful picture for me in my mind. Like I'm going to put Costa Rica in one of my bucket lists to visit. <laughs> Absolutely. A I mean, you had the Milky Way and like, you know, swimming yeah. in the this stars. Is happening. Like, this is happening. Oh Costa Rica is such a special place. Not because I'm from Costa Rica. It's because it's weird, you know. It has these tall mountains right in the middle. And if you descend to the Central Valley, it's a city like any other, so you get a lot of light pollution. But because the mountains are super steep, when you get to the other side, you don't get any light. And you get very clear skies because it's the influence from the Pacific. So that's why all those tiny little towns in there are super dark overnight. So yeah, that, it was really magic for me when I was just a kid. Man, I think you're right. We live in a world that is so polluted by light. Every big city that you go to there's no way you can see the milky way on the sky you really need to travel out to the outskirts or really hike somewhere else that's not light <laughs> yeah every time when i go to the balcony in my place in new york and i go out trying to find star everywhere oh, it's a, oh no it's an airplane uh, <laughs> oh yeah yeah no no that that's not a i don't know what it is <laughs> it's <a> problem, problem <laughs> or something uh so yeah People living in the cities, they don't know about this and it's a shame. So I hope we can, as a species, humans, we all come together to save these creatures and do something to enjoy the beauty of the lights in the night. Of nature. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> mm. Thank you for sharing such a beautiful story on that. Definitely have to tell my wife about it. So thank you again, Marco, for spending time with us today to talk about your whole info fail series. And there's a lot of valuable lessons that you have given us today. And I hope everyone learned something from this. We'll see everyone at the next episode. Thank you. Bye. Bye.